my children now. Welcome to prime time, Mitch. Not quite at that one yet. But today is a watch along on Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Now, I kicked off this channel with my very first video, and that was a watch along of the original 1984 Nightmare on Elm Street. And today I'm gonna to follow it up with another one. The idea is to watch each and every Nightmare on Elm Street, and then at the end of it, I'll do a big ranking. It is my favorite horror film, and probably my favorite franchise overall with, uh, with the impact that it's had on me. And of course, it's helped make the logo, and I've got enough paraphernalia in this room to prove that point. So today we're going to watch the second installment of Nightmare on Elm Street from 1985, starring Mark Patton, Kim Myers, Clue Gulliher, and of course, Robert Englund. I'm just going to get right into it. I've got my popcorn here. I've got a nice hot coffee here to keep me uh, going as I've got a, a gig to go to later. And stop drinking that damn coffee. And then I'll do a quick discussion at the end of it. I'll have a chat about the movie throughout and make some observations. I've seen this whole bunch of times, so this is uh, this is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Let's go. This is where we get the new New Line Cinema logo. We only got that budget one for the first movie. That school bus coming around the corner. So this is... A movie I watched when I was very young, I think I was about 11 maybe, something like that. And I kind of went backwards with my viewing of Nightmare on Elm Street. So I saw this one actually before the original, which is criminal really. That sound effect when Freddy's Revenge comes up is used so often in this. The sound in this movie is completely different from the first one. Uh, I, th I believe they got Christopher Young in uh, to do the music, uh, and he worked on a lot of horror, like Pet Cemetery, and I think Sinister was one of them, perhaps. Um, the Grudge. So he's worked on a lot of, of horror movies in the past, and a lot of the music in this is vastly different to the first. It was like they were going for a completely different theme. It's kind of a lot of almost Friday the 13th style sort of sound effects going on in this movie, I've noticed. That's kind of a nice little bit of trivia for anyone that hasn't already seen this movie, that Robert Englund is the one driving the bus, minus the makeup. I think it's a nice touch. I just think, I, you know, why not? What's also really cool about this as well is it's actually the opening scene. It, it's in the daytime, it's a bright sunny day. Usually you start like the first one, obviously in that dingy basement and all that creepy fog and all that. You don't get that here. You got the broad daylight to begin with and then you get hit with all this thunder and lightning and you see Freddy's glove. And it's a great opening scene, this. Definitely one of the high spots of the movie. It's going out into Tremors country. Yeah, I think this would have been pretty cool if it was just one girl because then you'd have been left wondering whether or not she was going to be the protagonist. I think because it's two of them, you know that it's pretty much going to be the, the young guy at the back. And I think this was the only Nightmare on Elm Street movie with a male, a male protagonist. Aside from Freddy, obviously. You're going nowhere. <sighs> that is such a great image of Freddy. I'll say this right off the bat, because I'll probably say it a lot after this, but Freddy is his absolute most terrifying in this movie. I wish this Freddy had been maintained in the later ones. I might have enjoyed them a little bit more. <laughs> Smooth. I think they talk about it in Scream Queen that he, I think it's in Never Sleep Again as well, how he, it says like Jesse screams like a girl or something like that, but he did have an incredible piercing scream. Many actresses I imagine would have been very proud of. Clue Gulliher is the star of the show. I love this guy so much and he's even funnier on the, uh, the Elm Street documentary. What a dude. Oh, see, that's, that's really cool, the Fu Man fingers. Just nice little sort of reminder of what he's just been through. Who is Lisa? <laughs> Easter eggs, dear. 
You eat your eggs, Clue. Because your son is hanging out with Meryl Streep. Apparently that's why Kim Myers was cast, because of her resemblance to Meryl Streep. I can't understand why that that would be a, a necessity, unless they just want, they thought she would have the same success as Meryl Streep off the back of this. Maybe she'd be another Johnny Depp kind of thing. Grady. I like the reverse roles here because it's like this girl going, are you getting any? That's kind of a guy's conversation that you usually see, a stereotypical guy's conversation like, you know, you've been laid yet, bro, and all that kind of stuff. It's nice to see them switch everything around in this one just for a change. What's different about this as well is Grady is kind of portrayed as the sort of cocky jock, but he's no real size to him or anything. He's kind of skinny and... <laughs> It's bizarre, but when I watched this as a kid, I just watched it as a horror film. It's only when you get older and you start clocking on to what was being done in this. You don't even need to see the documentaries when you're older. You just have to watch this once and go, I can see there's an undertone here. That always used to bother me when I was younger. They must have been doing push-ups for a long time before that because those were the worst push-ups I've ever seen. Literally just in the ground. Are you mounting or nightly or what? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Locked in there by her mother and she went crazy. She watched her boyfriend get butchered across the street by some maniac. You're full of shit, Brady. Got such a love-hate relationship, these two. I never quite cottoned on whether they were friends or enemies. Yeah, I do, I do quite like that this movie has, so I touched on this before, but I do like the fact that this movie has its own score. I just really miss that Bernstein piano in this to make me feel like it was Nightmare on Elm Street. This always feels like sort of a spin-off almost. I think that's a little in homage to the vodka bottle on the floor in the first one. It's such a similar shatter. I remember finding this scene pretty unnerving when I first watched it, just going out into your garden and looking into your boiler room and there's a guy just dumping things into the the boiler. What well, looked like limbs, I always thought it looked like an arm or something he threw in. But actually I think you find it's like, is it the glove or something that he's taken out of there? It's amazing how overactive your imagination is when you're younger. Right, I think this bit in a minute is very underrated. As a, as a scary scene. Not so much the aftermath, but the first part. This moment here when the shadow is getting closer to the stairs and you can clearly see he's making his way over there. I think that's really scary. I thought it was when I was a kid. <laughs> this is probably the clearest look we got of Freddy since well from the start they'd given him the contact lenses and everything made him look a bit creepier the witch knows he looks so much scarier in this ah that's fantastic and it's pulsating as well ah brilliant i think the parents reactions to him in this are very realistic his dad thinks he might be on drugs or something like that which is very understandable and they don't go to the clinic again and try and do the sleep tests and all that. I'm glad they didn't revisit that again. That's just a really nice looking steak. I never got this scene because he's dreaming of the snake round his neck and everything like that. But it's like, well, why would it have climbed out of the, the glass? I was always a bit confused by this one. Anybody wants to shed some light on this dream, please drop it in the comments. But I always like this scene for Grady's laugh at the end. It's not like he's imagining it because it's literally around his neck. <laughs> I love that bit. This is so good. God, Lisa's well off, isn't she? Back upstairs, Jesse. This has got to be the weirdest scene in 
any horror movie. Or certainly any mainstream horror movie. Can anybody tell me if they've actually cleaned their bedroom like this? Those glass, those sunglasses are incredible. It's just made more ridiculous by the fact that he is nothing like that in any part of the movie. It just comes out of nowhere. It's not, he's not had a drink or anything. No chicks. Probe, that game. <laughs> That's something I only noticed on like the third or fourth watch. This, apart from Grady mentioning it earlier and the passing reference to the house, this is the most we get from the first one. Sometimes when I'm lying here in bed, I can see Glenn in his window across the way, getting ready for bed. His body is slim and smooth, and I know I shouldn't watch him, but that part of me that wants him forces me to. That's when I weaken. It's a good job she didn't see him doing what he was just doing before. See, that's the image of Elm Street I always sort of associate. I, I think there was a blue door in the original, and they changed it to red for this for this movie. I think it suits the red door, actually. They really go off the, the heat and the fire and in this one. It's almost like the, the whole house becomes the boiler room. But I suppose if Freddy is taking over him, which is what this movie is about, he's going to feel that heat and feel that the, the flames and the burning sensation. Uh, so it does make a lot of sense. I always like the record bending over the, the table. I thought, I think that looks really cool. It is quite well paced, this movie. They don't throw everything at you. They give you nice little on and off scenes of this kid's torment, but you're not overloaded with material and exhausted with it. Ah, silhouette, it looks fantastic. Try it on for size. See, this is a point where you start realizing that he's not just there to kill him. He's, he's trying to use him for something or toy with him. You know, that's two occasions now where he's literally been in slashing distance with him and decided not to. Uh, <laughs> I remember seeing him in um, Total Recall and I was like, ah, oh, Schneider. Another really strange scene. Again, playing on the heat and the and the the temperature in the house. I love the bit actually when Klugelow goes to the temp the dial and says it's ninety three degrees in here. Like what the hell? I I, I really like that bit. Ninety seven. Sorry. I wonder whose idea it was to include the birds in this. And the fact that they're lovebirds as well, and one has murdered the other, is it's sort of more significant than if it was just a couple of budgerigars or finches or something. <laughs> it's a bizarre transition between it exploding, but it's, it's, it's a fun scene, it's uh, unusual. I won't put it up there with the classics though. <laughs> what a man. I always wanted a t-shirt with he used a goddamn cherry bomb on it. I need to watch more of his movies. I've only seen the last picture show when he was really young, but I need to see some more. He looks cold in that. I tell you, that charm of 80s horror, you, you just can't recreate it. Or at least, you know, I, I think you could if you put the effort in, but I, I, I would love to see somebody um, create a 
big successful mainstream horror movie now with all the elements of an 80s slasher or an 80s suspense horror um, because I love how they look and I love the sounds and I love the colours <laughs> Bob Shea getting his moment in a minute it's just the very thought of him walking in off the street in his pyjamas you know, nobody stops him at the door and goes, well, for one, you're paying to get in, and two, you probably should be better dressed than that. But I guess that could be fetish dress, I suppose. Pajamas, maybe. <laughs> I have I wonder what he did with that gear afterwards. I'll tell you, the school give Schneider a lot of leeway. Yeah, of course. Come and use the facilities at night after you've been... Uh, in your seedy joints. Bring whoever you want back. It's such a weird scene. This I'm seeing a theme, there's a lot of weird scenes in this movie. He's getting bombarded with balls. <laughs> That's cool. I always remember thinking, oh, it's not that bad, this scene, he'd be okay. And then I saw the dumbbell fly out the window. I was like, okay, that's pretty serious. Medicine ball had hurt as well. This is so... Oh. Like I said, you only, you only notice the undertones and the significance of this when you're older. This is incredible. They were not going to cast Robert Englund for this movie. And this was a stunt double. Or the guy that they were gonna have play him. And just look at the movements. He's literally walking like Michael Myers. Just doesn't suit Freddy at all. So glad they changed their mind and paid him what they wanted. Ugh. I mean, I, I never also bought that, you know, he slashes him a couple of times in the back. They must not show everything there because that wouldn't have killed him. If that was the case, Jesus Christ would have had a lot easier time of it. Another big scream there. <laughs> Does this. It's such a reasonable thing to, to ask though. And I kind of, I always felt like he he, 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 asks, he answers him like it was a dumb question and it really wasn't. I love that they're fixing the bars back onto the house. Were they all in the basement or something from Marge? He's like, ah, oh, I can see why they, these were installed now. See, that's where he's becoming a little bit more unreasonable. But I guess if you're, <laughs> I guess if you're at the at the end of your rope, you would start behaving like that because he's obviously not responding to your concerns. There's that sound effect again. I tend to enjoy this movie more if I see it, if I detach it from the nightmare story. It's a little bit like Halloween in the sense that you kind of choose which timeline or, or which movies you want to entertain. I kind of look at this as like a Freddy's Nightmares thing almost like, you know, the series that they, they did. That's a cool image. There you go, kill for me. So, you know, you're, you're there to be a vessel. See, that, that's a, a nod to the first one. Pretty cool image as well. Really creepy. Creepy kids are always effective, but there's something about that jump rope. Nursery rhyme. Time to confront. Absolutely nothing. 
He set that up a little, didn't he? That's good, that. I like that. Great reaction from both parents as well, there. I may be wrong, but I think that's the last time we see the parents in this. I may be wrong, it's been a while. But it's almost like the last scene that they're in is the one where they actually realise there is something wrong with this house and maybe... Maybe he's not on drugs or crazy. But you never get to see the outcome after it. I think you see them right at the end after it's all finished, but I think from here on in, it's pretty much just Jesse and Lisa. That's the first time you hear Kruger. She said his name is Fred in the diary, but obviously Lisa's done some reading. They used to refer to him as Fred in the first ones, in the first two specifically. Only Freddy really came in in sort of the third. She says that so dryly. I needed a bit more out of her there. <laughs> it's pretty cute. At least it wasn't a cat. Variation of the trope. This scene's pretty cool just to get a look at the house. A lot of people talk about this movie being a little sort of random, a bit thrown together. I don't think that that would have been as much of a criticism had it not been the direct sequel to the first one. I think because of that it, it felt more disjointed because we see a lot more disjointed efforts later on down the line. Oh no, maybe it wasn't the last time we see them. May as well have been though, there's not much to that scene. Robert Roosler and this is funny. I, I can't, the fact he said he threw his grandma on a flight of stairs, I'm almost sort of 10% believing him. <laughs> How much food did he have in his mouth to still have his mouth full throughout that entire scene? Not once does he swallow. Looks like a hamster. That's a truly terrible chef's hat. It looks like the bedside lamp when he woke up and it had melted. This guy looks like Jerry the King Lawler. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> I wanted to have a good time at the pool party, but he put me in charge of the barbecue. Because he wanted to go and do what I was here to do. <laughs> What's that little run he does there? You don't look like you're dressed for it either. This is, this is like, this is exactly what he walks around the house in at night. What makes me laugh here is that what makes them think that they don't want to do it with the lights on? Was that an unwritten rule back in the 80s or something? The lights have to go off first. And what makes them think that they're just they're going to fall asleep immediately when the lights go off and they won't hear all this music outside and all this crazy behaviour. Like a force field goes around the house as soon as the lights go off. The tongue's really been a theme all the way through, hasn't it? I mean, it's very prevalent in the third one. It comes through the phone twice in, in two of the movies, and you've got that there. Wes Craven's new nightmare, it's it's a big deal. There's a lot of tongue associated with Freddy Krueger. 
I'm not surprised. Can you imagine? For a moment there, it's like, oh shit, home invasion. Oh. See, that's the unusual thing about this one as well. He only seems to be tormenting Jesse. He doesn't seem to be in the mind or the dreams of the other kids. You know, Grady's not having that problem. Uh, Lisa hasn't had any nightmares. A friend hasn't, as far as we know. So it's only, he's targeting one kid in the neighborhood, which is, again, that's very unusual. It broke a lot of rules, this movie, as we'll soon, we'll soon find out. That looks like such an uncomfortable seat. So he's playing the Johnny Depp to his Nancy. Again, the roles are swapped. So he's on the couch this time and Grady's in the bed. They can't do that one simple thing, can they? But I don't understand what it matters whether he goes to sleep or not, or is it, is it, I don't know, does him falling asleep cause Freddy to come out of Jesse? This is a triumph for practical effects. This really is great. As much as a lot of this doesn't seem to add up very well, this, this scene always stands out. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, I, I used to wince at that when I was a kid. The noise it makes as well when it opens up. Ugh. I don't know why he didn't just go out the window. I mean, that's another another question I always had from this. If he got in through the window, he could have got out through it. That's a great shot. And I, I know how they did that as well. I think it was very simplistic. I think it was one of the producers or someone that just had a look through this model. Oh. oh, that's a good shot too. He looks so mean, man. I, honestly, that is... I mean, he puts the hat on and then just sort of nods at him like, you know, you're, you're dead, boy. I, I just, he's so brutal in this, Freddy. Look at him, he's terrifying. This little nod here. In a minute. There. Oh, my God. That's the best, the most effective looking Freddy of all. I mean, the kill's kind of, it's all right, it's okay, it's nothing amazing. There's some possibility issues with it, but oh, it's just Freddy's presence in this scene alone pushes that kill up. And then he's back to normal again, he's all, all in one piece. It's so much of a head f God, he looks, this is, the, this is my favorite Freddy, I keep saying it. Mark Patton's acting in this is very, very, very good. And as much as this movie was probably, well, from when you when you watch the, the documentaries, it was a bit of a problem for him. His performance is up there, I think, with some of the best horror performances of all time. I think it deserves recognition in general, to be honest. This is the first time they showed sort of these promiscuous teenagers almost uh, in the same vein as Friday the 13th would. You didn't really see it in the first one. So you didn't tell her about the glove on, on camera, so that's another thing they've discussed off. She wouldn't know about the glove had he not told her about it, I don't think. I'm so mixed about this part of the movie. Yeah, I can never dislike this bit, but at the same time, it just 
doesn't make any sense. And Wes Craven obviously wasn't particularly thrilled about this scene either. It's almost like a sickness, isn't it? Oh, it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna throw up kind of thing. I love, this is another example of how great Freddy looks though, in this, uh, particularly in this house scene when he gets up from behind the couch. Oh, this is, this is, if, this is good. The, That's scary Freddy, man. There's a bit coming up where he's sort of standing there next to the shelf and he just kicks this ornament on the floor and he looks so badass. Oh, the way his movement and everything. This is honestly just number one. If I ever rank the Freddies, this is 100% number one. Oh, so effective. That makeup is revolting as well. Some, I saw somebody on YouTube, fair enough opinion, said he looked too greasy for him and everything, which I can understand. I really preferred this makeup though. Look at that, he looks horrible. And he never has the glove on at any point, other than the first scene in the dream sequence. The rest of the time, it's coming out the ends of his fingers. Mm. Yeah, it didn't make any sense for him to be out at this pool party in the in the real world. Um, He's just becoming sort of a almost a ghost or a, or a paranormal entity at that point, which I suppose he is. But his world is the dreamscape. It's the, it's the dreams. I'll never understand them getting out of the pool when it was boiling a minute ago. They'd be scalded. So there's a few inaccuracies here. I I struggle to suspend disbelief for but this one in particular. As great as this scene is, if you just like watching Freddy be evil and brutal, for a story perspective, it means. Very little. God, he looks so good though. Oh. I mean, it's kind of cool to see him getting some kills in. You know, it almost like, for a minute there he becomes something a little bit different. You don't often see Freddy on a killing spree all in one, all in one go. Jesus, slaying each other here. Oh, that's a good one. Help yourself, fucker. <laughs> oh, look how good he looks there. I love a really good quality photo of that. You know, with the smoke behind him. If anything, this movie gives us one of my favourite quotes and scenes in a minute. This bit, that I mean, that that's iconic. So we get that at least. It's kind of unusual how he just bypasses all these kids as well. It's just, a, it's just, it is out of character. It is strange, but there's some fun to be had with it. weird <laughs> I don't think they quite came out how they'd intended it's like a twisted version of Cerberus isn't it but 
This is the first time you saw the boiler room as a building. Um, the first one, it was mainly just the interior. This was the first time anybody walked in from the outside. So it's all kind of useful footage if you want to compile some kind of narrative of your own. If you were to compile a bunch of Nightmare on Elm Street scenes together to make one big story, there's some really nice shots in this. She's playing tricks with her head, but she's not dreaming. It's, it's weird, it's like there's something about that building and his aura and presence that creates this hallucination or sense of detachment. Again, it's all, it was hard to sort of know what re, what was reality and what wasn't in some of the other ones. At least you knew, you were told they were dreaming eventually. In this one, you don't really know why she's having these hallucinations and these struggles with re, what's real and what's not. I've got to say as well in this one, as evil as he is, he doesn't really put up much of a fight in this. I feel like I've read up on the details of this movie and what it actually meant before, but I kind of wanted to go into this just watching it without all this this ammunition of information behind me. That's kind of what my channel's founded on. I know the bare minimum in order to get a proper response, but I never understood why exactly this happened to him here. What turns on all the, the all this? What turns on all these pipes? What makes him burn? I mean, that's a great effect. That looks fantastic. That's such an effective shot of the jawbone and everything. They use a lot of whale noise. I heard whenever Freddy was in was in the vicinity. It was sort of to try and create that eerie dream feel. Just wearing Freddy's shell is like a Russian doll almost. Body inside a body. And back where we started. You've got to wonder how that was dealt with and resolved, you know, all these murders and everything. They never tell you what happened with them and, you know, did they never come and question him about Grady or anything like that? Yeah, it's a strange one. I guess those things are... That's just too much information, I think. <laughs> Calm down, Jesse. It's not Robert England in the driver's seat anymore. I mean, the shot of him going into the desert with the, the claw tree. That's pretty cool, but I, I actually never liked that hook. Um, I actually thought that was sillier than the first one. The first one never really bothered me too much, where it bothered a lot of people. I think that one made even less sense, but... Okay, so that was Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, from 1985, a year after the release of the original Nightmare on Elm Street by Wes Craven, directed by Jack Shoulder. There is so much about this movie that has been talked about in recent years. It's gained a cult following for the homoerotic side of it that um, initially, like I said, I watched it when I was a young, very young uh, kid, so I didn't really pick up on any of that. I just saw it as a horror movie. Uh, since then, there's been an awful lot of um, talk of the subtext and Yes, it's very prevalent when you watch it again, certainly uh, in a more mature state. But I do tend to sort of just bypass that because that's sort of something on its own. You want to know about all that and you want to know about Mark Patton's experience, then definitely I would advise you to watch Scream Queen. It's a fascinating documentary on that particular subject regarding this movie. In terms of the movie itself, if you want to know about the production and the writing and some of the, the complications and criticisms that this movie faced from either side, I would definitely point you in the direction of Never Sleep Again, The Elm Street Legacy. That is a fantastic in-depth look at every single movie from this franchise. Uh, from a personal perspective, it's not in my top Nightmare on Elm Street, I found it to be very complicated with far too much ambiguity. A lot of rules are broken, a lot of things don't make a ton of sense, uh, and I think that that's the problem. If you watch it as a standalone movie, like I said, if you try almost treat it like a Freddy's Nightmare, you know, like, like, like the TV series that they created, it's actually a really good watch. I think if you try and make it fit with the Elm Street story and uh, what came before it, 
uh, it, it doesn't hold up as well. Like I said, if because it was a direct sequel to the first, I think that that's what suffered. Uh, that's why it suffered. I think if this had been later down the line, it might have been received a little better because I think they'd broken quite a lot of rules at that point and they'd done a lot of randomness uh, by that point and people were used to it. And one thing I will say uh, for this movie, which I said throughout and I'll, I'll say it again, it's the best Freddy in my opinion. He is dark, he is evil he's I, I was never a big fan of the comedic wise cracking freddy as you'll find out um in the later in the later watch alongs that i do i i didn't like the comedy aspect of him maybe a little but it had to be dark and subtle but i think the wise cracking freddy never did anything for me i know it was a commercial success but i wanted the dark evil freddy this guy is a child killer he is uh evil he is vengeful he is he is just scum basically and i don't want to see him cracking jokes and being stupid uh so this was my favorite version of freddy he looked amazing the makeup Divides opinion, I think, from what I've seen on YouTube, but I really like his makeup in this. I like the introduction of the, the hook nose and the, the contact lenses look fantastic in this. I liked the the vicious style, the vicious nature of his burns. If you check out the second video I did on this channel, it was an interview with Paul Bailey, who does an absolutely mind-blowing version of the Nightmare 2 Freddy, and in my eyes, should play him in anything that is penned for the foreseeable. This is my, my favorite Freddy. He, he acts, looks, and behaves in exactly the way I would want him to behave. We It's basically the first one, but just more of it, and a more horrific look. So that absolutely has it going for it. It has some good scenes. The bus scene is fantastic. The effects on the chest bursting scene are brilliant if a little unrealistic when he returns to full form after it and the pool party as ridiculous as it is and as many rules as it breaks and how much it shouldn't be there it's still a fantastic scene to see freddy causing chaos and destroying everyone in his wake and then you know you are all my children now at the end which really topped it off so it has its moments it's a nice watch if you watch it as a standalone movie about the possession of jesse uh, which is a complete u-turn from the actual story of freddy where he is invading the dreams of multiple kids in vengeance for the parents this was a totally different story they unusually chose to follow up the first one with watch it on its own it's great as part of the story i put it further down the list i'm a huge freddy krueger fan i love nightmare on elm street so i don't dislike this or, or hate it in any way i don't really hate any of them but there are certain ones that I, I sort of really want to steer clear from this isn't one of them this is kind of midway drop your comments in below let me know what you think whether you disagree or agree with any of my thoughts on this movie whether you had a different experience watching it the first time than i did and tell me where this ranks in your favorites of this franchise thank you so much guys for watching this watch along it has been a long time since i did the first one but we have grown and i have done a lot since and i can't wait to get to three because that's a personal favorite of mine if you like this video and you like my content, please smash a like down below, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell, and you will know exactly when I'm putting a new video out and exactly what is on it. Cheers guys, this was Nightmare on Street 2. I've been Primetime Mitch, I'll see you shortly.